welcome. And welcome to the first event of uh, 2015 for the Central Coast Enterprise Forum. I think you're uh, as uh, excited about this as I am about the, our program is about uh, disruptive medical technologies breakthrough on the Central Coast. Uh, my name is Guy Smith. I'm on the board for the uh, Central Coast uh, Enterprise Forum. And I'm standing in for Melissa Marino, and I'm a very bad imitation of her. Um, but uh, she's uh, in business on Sacramento. So tonight's event is about breakthrough technology and the tr treatment of diabetes, the largest non-infectious chronic disease in the world. And we have some uh, exciting uh, panelists and uh, presenters for you tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize our premier sponsors for the MIT Enterprise Forum who are here tonight. And if you could just stand and give us a wave as I call your name. Uh, Bank of the West, there he is, uh, CIO Solutions, Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, Nasif Hicks, where's Kathy, there she is, uh, Pacific Coast Business Times, uh, SoCal IP Law Group, there you are, and uh, Stradling Attorneys. So thank you very much. Um, I do want to mention that uh, the February event is February 18th. And I'm pretty excited about this event as well. The next internet risk and rewards of the internet of things. So devices, sensors, and gadgets are overtaking people on the web, creating the internet of things by 2020. Internet, Internet of Things will grow to be worth $3 trillion, uh, with include 30 billion interconnected devices. So we're going to get an education on that um, topic as well. So without going on, I'd like to introduce Christy Horton, who is the moderator of tonight. And Christy, it's all yours. Welcome. So tonight's topic, breaking te breakthrough technology in diabetes treatment, couldn't be more timely um, diabetes, as Guy mentioned, is the largest non-infectious chronic disease in the world today. And the president highlighted the need for a new era of medicine um, in diabetes treatment in his State of the Union address last night when he launched his Precision Medicine Initiative. This life-changing medical technology known as the artificial pancreas system or systems has been developed right here on the Central Coast. It's arguably the most significant advance since local scientists isolated insulin here. It's available today and is poised to revolutionize disease management. We're extremely fortunate to have a panel of leading experts in the field here tonight uh, to discuss the technology and the opportunities around these breakthroughs. Our keynote speaker is Professor Frank Doyle. He's the department chair and professor of chemical engineering at UCSB. He was named Santa Barbara's 2000, uh, 2012 Innovator of the Year for the worldwide impact of his bioengineering R&D of artificial pancreas technology for type 1 diabetes patients. He led the development of process control, tech, process control software for the artificial pancreas system, which has been licensed at several sites worldwide for clinical trials. Professor Doyle holds the Duncan and Suzanne Melichamp Chair in Process Control at UCSB and is a professor of electrical and computer engineering as well as chemical engineering. He is the director of the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies and the Associate Dean of Research for the College of Engineering. And our panelists tonight are Dr. Tom Pizer and Mr. Frederick Gluck. Dr. Pizer is the co-founder and chief scientist of Automated Gluco Glucose Control, which is an early stage medical device company providing software solutions to insulin pump companies. His work is focused on facilitating and expediting the commercialization of artificial pancreas products for patients with diabetes. Previously, Dr. Pizer was the VP of Science and Technology at Dexcom, where he led the company's artificial pancreas research and his collaborations with academic research groups around the world. Dr. Pizer has 20 years of experience in R&D and diabetes technology, including extensive work in continuous glucose monitoring and our artificial pancreas technology. 
and Mr. Gluck, who come up to the panel, is retired CEO of the international uh, management consulting firm McKinsey & Company, vice chairman and director of the Bechtel Group, and director of Amgen and HCA. He received the 2012 South Coast Business and Technology Pioneer Award and has long been active as an entrepreneur in local biotech and uh, biomedical equipment companies. He currently serves on the boards of Syn uh, Synvenio Biosystems, of which he is co-founder and chairman, True Vision, of which he is co-chairman, co and Cytomics, which he co-founded. He's also served as a trustee of Cottage Health Systems, the UCSB Foundation, and as founding chairman of the Advisory Council of the Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics. So we're gonna hold all of our questions until the second half of the program, which will be a moderated panel discussion. And please note that Mr. Gluck must leave a bit early due to a prior engagement. Thank you, and I'll pass the microphone to Frank. Okay, terrific. Well, well, Christy, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation tonight. Thank you all for coming out to hear about this exciting work. I chose the title, Engineering the Artificial Pancreas, to reflect the fact that I'm trained as an engineer. I've enjoyed a delightful partnership with doctors here in Santa Barbara. So this really has been a labor of love between doctors and engineers, and we often refer to it as medically inspired engineering. And you'll get a sense for that as I walk through this. For those of you not familiar, um, Christy touched on this, diabetes is a worldwide problem. You see some of the numbers here on the screen, worldwide, um, close to 400 million people with diabetes. Uh, in the U.S., about 37 million, about two-thirds of them know it, and about a third of them are undiagnosed as of yet. It's um, healthcare costs in the U.S. alone run north of $240 billion a year from the direct costs associated with treating diabetes and then treating the complications of diabetes as well. So it's a, a terrible affliction. Um, in California here, it's a huge burden as well. One in seven Californians have diabetes. Again, about two-thirds of them um, are aware of that. They've been diagnosed, and, and about a third of them are not diagnosed. So that's about four million people here in our state. And the, the annual health care costs in California run somewhere around $25 billion. Again, for the direct costs associated with diabetes as well as the treatment of the complications of diabetes. Now, what I'm going to do is walk you through a, a cartoon. If there are medical doctors here, uh, apologies to my uh, sort of corrupting a uh, physiology text, if you will. I'm going to give you an engineer's interpretation of the plumbing in the body. And so when things are going well, when the body is naturally regulating blood sugars, you all enjoyed some snacks earlier, what's happening is your pancreas is releasing these two hormones. Um, insulin, denoted in yellow in my cartoon here, and glucagon, denoted in blue. These are counter-regulatory hormones. They work very much like the brakes and the gas in your car. Insulin's the brakes. What insulin does is it brings down blood sugar when it's at too high a level. It does that by facilitating the uptake of blood sugar in the cells, so it allows the fat, the muscle, the other tissues to absorb glucose, and that leads to a lowering. So that's like the brakes on the high blood sugars. Glucagon, on the other hand, is the counter-regulatory hormone that leads to the breakdown of glycogen in the liver. So you've got glycogen stores, which then when they're broken down, produce glucose that gets into the bloodstream and that elevates the levels of blood sugars. So you have this counter-regulatory balance, if you will, that keeps the blood sugars on track. Now, in a healthy individual, here's a plot from one of my graduate students some years ago who wore a continuous glucose monitor, a blood sensor, to track their sugars. And what you're seeing is a relatively rock-steady line, that magenta line that bounces a little bit across the screen. Um, I'm told, I wasn't directly there with the student, that this included a uh, Friday night of bowling and pizza and beer at Zotos, so this was a suitable challenge for his pancreas. But you can see, very rock-steady a proverbial uh, flat line in a good way, a very healthy flat line. So what happens in individuals who have type 1 diabetes? The immune system attacks the pancreas's beta cells. These are the cells that produce the insulin. So my cartoon here, I've uh, darkened out the insulin pathway there because the body's not producing insulin. And that's the challenge for somebody who um, has type 1 diabetes. So they manually have to administer insulin because in the absence of doing that, their blood sugars would go sky high. They would have so-called hyperglycemia. 
And the long-term complications of hyperglycemia basically affect everywhere the blood flows in the body, throughout the vasculature, the organs, the tissues. And you see a list of some of the complications, retinopathy, neuropathy, cardiovascular disease, that result from this elevated blood sugar level. So the solution is to have an individual manually administer insulin. So somebody will do calculations. For example, they'll calculate the grams of carbohydrate in the, the fancy appetizers we had here, figure out a correction factor for their own body, and then deliver the insulin that would correspond to canceling that meal. The problem with that is that humans are prone to errors in calculations, even engineers, and one can overdo it. One can give too much insulin, and that leads to hypoglycemia. Now, hyperglycemia, the elevated blood sugars, is dangerous in the long term, compromising blood flow and the, the access to sugar throughout the body. Hypoglycemia leads to more immediate problems. So this could be in the short term, headaches, trembling, anxiety, confusion, dizziness, or worse, coma, uh, and possibly death. So this is the balance, that if untreated, you have elevated blood sugars. If overtreated, you have hypo or suppressed blood sugars. And this is the challenge. And here's a plot from one of the subjects. When I moved here about 12 years ago, we, we struck up a wonderful collaboration with the doctors at Sansom. And this was a month-long trace of one of the subjects who had been managing their own diabetes. And what you're seeing plotted here is the concentration of glucose, the blood sugar. And this is the axis that I'll be using throughout the talk here. And what I want to draw your attention to, I'm going to move over here. I hope you can all hear me. Can you hear me in the back if I don't have the mic? Good. Okay. So this green zone here is the desirable zone. We can keep the blood sugars in that zone. The doctors tell us that the complications are minimized. So the goal is to try to keep the blood sugar. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So we want to keep those blood sugars in the green zone. And what you're seeing is, unfortunately, there's a lot of time spent outside of the green zone. In fact, the font's too tiny to see, but this computer printout reports that only 55% of the time was this subject within the boundaries that the doctor would like to see. And in fact, there are a number of excursions on the order of about 20% of this data is above the green zone. That's the hyperglycemic, that's the elevated state, long-term complications of diabetes. And somewhere on the order of about 20% of the data is also below the green zone. In fact, there's a dangerous fraction of the data, 17 events that go below 50 milligrams per deciliter. This is a very dangerously low hypoglycemic state. A typical month in the life of this individual trying to self-manage their diabetes, and you see the challenge. So I want you to keep in mind this green zone because when I talk about our technology later, we're gonna evaluate it or benchmark it against the ability to rein the subject's blood sugars into closer control in the green zone. Left to their own devices about 50% of the time. So the trick here is to take the human out of the loop, prone to those various errors and uh, inaccuracies, and we wanna automate this system. We wanna use a computer algorithm to automatically calculate what that insulin dosing should be take the human, take the calculations, take the scribbling out of the equation, do something that's far more sophisticated here. So that's the goal. And so to do this, we're using technology that has come onto the market over the course of the last several years. In the case of insulin pumps, maybe the last uh, 10 or 15 years of maturity here. I'm not, particularly, I'm not picking any particular favorite brand here, but showing you several of the products that have been in the market. Um, this little chart here, it may be an eye chart for most of you except the front row, basically compares um, devices like a cardiac defibrillator on the far left side all the way down to very simple MP3 players or mobile phones on the right side. And the point here is to show that the complexity of something like an insulin pump is probably somewhere in the middle. The regulatory barriers are there, unlike a, an iPhone, for example. Um, but the cost and complexity is certainly not in the same league as a cardiac defibrillator. It's a simpler piece of technology. And in fact, um, I've got a video here from one of the companies we work with. This is Omnipod. They make a pump, and I'm going to let the video play so you can see what this pump technology looks like. There's no uh, audio here, so I'll narrate a little bit. I've got one of these pumps up here. After the talk, you're welcome to come up and take a look. They're very tiny, very small footprint. And the footprint is basically half a stack of batteries and half an insulin reservoir. So this is what's hiding under the hood here for this device. So you see some fundamental limitations in terms of shrinking these things. These things don't have, these type of pumps, the patch pumps don't have 
uh, tethers, there's no cables, there's no um, tubing for the insulin, it's all self-contained in the device. You charge the uh, device, flip it over on the back, and you can inject the insulin. The system primes, uh, gets that insulin then into the tubing, removes the air that's in the tubing, loads the uh, chambers to prepare to be able to deliver the insulin. And this is now filling that chamber. There's actually somebody wearing theirs, to give you a feeling again for the footprint. Um, this is actually a previous generation. This is about 2009, 2010. They keep getting smaller. And this automatically will do um, everything from then not only delivering the insulin, but even injecting the needle in something like one two hundredth of a second. There's a quick insertion then of a very tiny gauge needle. So that's the insulin technology, the insulin delivery technology, very mature. By the same token, the measurement technology has matured dramatically over the last five years in particular. That is the ability to measure in real time what's going on in the body with your blood sugars. And real time for the problem that we're talking about here is every five minutes. So if we could sample every five minutes, get an update on the blood sugars, we can use that information to inform an insulin pump then on the right moves to fine tune and adjust the insulin delivery. And again, I've got a movie here just to give you a flavor for one of the devices we use. There's audio on this one, so we'll, if I can get the mouse, there we go. Let you see how this one, whoops, works. The data we get from biometric sensors can be eye-opening and it can be life-saving. And take Michelle Forney. I have uh, type 1 diabetes. I was diagnosed when I was six years old. Once a week, she places a sensor on her abdomen, which continuously records her glucose levels. The battery is also a wireless radio and sends the vital information to this receiver. Periodic okay, testing you know. only provides a snapshot, while the Dexcom sensor gives her ongoing data. 24-7, every five minutes, where my glucose is. So that piece of the technology has also matured quite a bit over the last couple of years. And I'm holding here what the actual device was she implanted. You can come up again after the talk and take a peek. It's very tiny, the size of a small flash drive, basically. So we can measure the blood sugars. We can dose the insulin. What's missing from the puzzle? Well, really, this is where we come in. And that's an algorithm, a chip, a piece of code, some brains to link the glucose measurement within the insulin dosing. And so our team has been thinking hard about this problem for quite some time. There are folks who have been thinking about this problem longer. Um, back when I was uh, one year old, I think, there was a gentleman in Beverly Hills named uh, Arnold Kadish who came up with one, what one might call one of the early prototypes of an artificial pancreas. It was not a very portable device, as you can see from the picture here. Hidden from the photograph is the fact that there's a 12-foot extension cord connecting this, so it's really not ambulatory. Um, but this, these were early days in thinking about trying to automate. He does have an IV tap as well, so this is a fairly invasive uh, procedure. One tap to measure his sugars, one tap to deliver his insulin. And, you know, in the course of the 60s and 70s, a number of groups did studies, typically in hospitals. The complexity of the technology uh, here is an example of what I've shown you in those two tiny devices. This is what it took in those days to do this. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you what is really an algorithm, what is really a piece of code that given a measurement of blood sugar, they would dose the insulin according to this chart. So for those of you engineers in the audience, you could imagine transducing this to a, an equation, a formula that then says, as a function of the blood sugar measurement, I know exactly how much insulin to administer. And for most of the spectrum of blood sugars we'd measure, this line has a constant slope, so it's a very primitive linear algorithm. Again, these were the early days. You jump to the present. A couple years ago, there was a full-page ad in the New York Times touting the artificial pancreas as perhaps the most revolutionary treatment in diabetes since the discovery of insulin. It's a big deal. This is now getting international attention. Jump to uh, just this past year, 2014, and here in Santa Barbara, we were getting a lot of attention for the AP, so there was a, a piece in science that had a quote from the lab here talking about how we're trying to do this. And this is a nice picture that appeared in JAMA in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association in uh, the spring with one of the doctors we've been working very close with, Howard Sister, and myself uh, during one of the first clinical trials. And the, the tagline here was fully automatic artificial pancreas, finally within reach. 
So things have really changed dramatically over the last couple of years. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of different aspects of how we got to where we are today, and then uh, turn things over to the panel for some more detailed discussion. So let me start with the systems that underlie what we're trying to do. And I'm going to share with you a roadmap that the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation published on the order of about eight, seven, eight years ago as they began to invest heavily in this capability for the artificial pancreas. And they had a whole spectrum of possibility for this technology from simply shutting a pump off if your blood sugars got too low so you didn't continue to put insulin in, moving all the way up through in this first generation, trying to minimize the lows, blunt the highs, ultimately into what they call second generation, which is really where we are today, and this is what I'm gonna show you in our clinical trials, where you've automated that feedback loop. We're either with some modest intervention from the subject, like counting the carbohydrates in their food, or invisibly doing this fully automatically without any human intervention required. So a big, big part of the problem, and you'll hear a little bit more about this, I think, from Tom as well, has been the regulatory process. So dealing with the FDA, um, when we first started doing these trials at Sansom in 2007, the FDA very quickly intervened and said, okay, academic research will also require regulatory approval. So they put some hurdles on the academic uh, research enterprise. And we were required to do something called an IDE, an investigational device exemption. So that is to say a subject can have their own pump. You can be prescribed a pump. You can buy a CGM. But to make them work together, that needs regulatory approval. And so to get that approval, what you see my students holding here are literally feet of binders, if we stacked them up, that we had to submit to get approvals to do these kinds of trials. So it was a rather complicated process. And these days, I would say, what, hey, all in a few weeks, we can put together some of these uh, reports. It used to take months, but it's a much more efficient process. So at the core of this, the brains, if you will, and this is where my group comes in, we have a feedback algorithm. We have an algorithm that makes an intelligent decision about the glucose measurement and how much insulin to secrete. And at the core of that algorithm is something we call model predictive control. We published this about 20 years ago, the idea that we would take technology that is the present technology running oil refineries, running chemical plants, used in aerospace flight controllers, used in your anti-lock brake systems in your car, your traction control systems. This is a rather pervasive technology except in the biomedical realm. So we're translating a tried and true engineering algorithm to the medical space. And the idea in doing this is we're gonna use a horizon. We're gonna forecast, use a mathematical model of the body to predict in the future where the blood sugar is gonna go. So knowing what insulin we've delivered, knowing what food's been ingested, knowing what exercise has been undertaken, we make a forecast of where those blood sugars are going. And based on that forecast, we're gonna calculate how much insulin would be required to bring the blood sugars into that green zone that we talked about earlier. So that's at the core of the algorithm. And we had the idea 20 years ago. We didn't have the pumps and the sensors 20 years ago to make this a reality. So I'm gonna show you a cartoon of how one does this, and I'll try to do this without any equations, which is hard for an engineering professor. But here's the idea. Imagine that this vertical line right here is now. This is the present time. Everything to the left is the past. I know what my blood sugars have been. I know what my insulin pump has been doing. I now want to predict the future. I want to make a forecast into the future of where that blood sugar is going to go. And in one version of our algorithm, if the blood sugar stays in the green zone, we do nothing. The doctors would say the subject has good control of their glucose, so we don't need to modulate the insulin pump, let the pump continue to deliver what it's doing now. But if in the future, as we step forward, we learn, that we predict their blood sugars will go high, they just had a meal. Then we're gonna adjust the insulin delivery to put more insulin in the body to cancel the high blood sugars that are coming. And we'll step forward in time, we'll move this line from left to right as we get new information. So I might calculate for the next two hours what that insulin should be, but in five minutes when I get a new measurement, I'm gonna repeat the whole process. This is what we call in engineering terms a receding horizon algorithm. Now, for the engineers in the audience, here's the one and only equation I'm gonna put up. <laughs> Savor it, that's it. Now, for the rest of you who aren't engineers, I described an algorithm where I forecast many moves in the future, I collected a measurement, and I repeated the whole process. Does that remind anybody of a, a game? 
many moves in the future, but you only get to do one. Chess, right? The grandmasters make many moves ahead. The opponent moves, they have to repeat the strategy. So this is very much like the strategy of chess, a receding horizon framework. But we're forecasting about 12 moves ahead. So that would be um, not quite in deep blue's uh, domain of uh, competing the computer that uh, defeated uh, Kasparov, but chess masters, I guess, would be up in that range. Okay, so the other piece of this puzzle that we've done at UCSB, in particular Al Dassau, who's sitting here in the audience, has been to make a platform to let us do testing of devices in the clinic. So we've made a very neutral, if you will, operating system that connects a variety of pumps from different companies, a variety of sensors from different companies, and they're in a shared platform where now one can take an algorithm, one can plug in using a very modular design and test control under different clinical scenarios. So this has been another part of the UCSB innovation. So that's all I'm gonna say about the system design. We can talk in the panel if people have engineering questions. Let me tell you about the testing of this algorithm. And really this wouldn't have happened if I hadn't moved here 13 years ago and discovered the wonderful doctors at the Sansom Clinic. They have remarkable facilities here for a, for a small town medical clinic. Some of you may know, it was mentioned in the introduction that this is where insulin was first administered in the US in the 1920s. The first place in the US was right here in Santa Barbara shortly after the first place in the world in Canada by Banting and Best. So we have facilities at Sanson where we can test these algorithms. We can very quickly go from the aha in the engineer's mind out at UCSB to talking to doctors, testing, implementing this in the trial. And that's what accelerated our work about a dozen years ago. So I had this timeline. Again, I apologize, the fonts are probably small. What I wanted to show you was 20 years ago we had an idea. We prototyped an algorithm. And in particular, over the last 12 years living here in Santa Barbara, we have run all these little hash marks or different clinical trials, different cohorts of patients testing different realizations of our algorithm, different dimensions of the algorithm. And so here's a snapshot from one of those trials. In fact, this was the very, very first trial that we conducted here with the doctors in Santa Barbara. The FDA had just uh, slowed things down in the US, so we did what any company would do. We went offshore, we found colleagues in Israel, very quickly ran some pilot uh, studies there, came back to Santa Barbara, completed 22 subjects. And what I'd like to show you here in this curve, this is what we call a, a cumulative histogram. This is simply a way of plotting as a function of blood sugar, what fraction of the subjects had blood sugars this level or lower. So as we get to a top number like 400, everybody had blood sugars 400 or lower. The orange envelope is what the subjects were doing on their own. So you see far more of the orange envelope out in the high blood sugar numbers. When we turn the algorithm on, we tighten these numbers, we straighten that line so we have much tighter control. Now in terms of the green zones that we talked about at the beginning of my talk, for the green zones, under this trial, we spent 70% of the time in the green zone. This was our first closed loop trial. And if we really tighten, we take half of the envelope of the green zone, which is the really tight euglycemic range some doctors would love to see, we're about 36% of the time in that range. So very good early clinical uh, results. The next uh, trial that we did had a few um, less subjects, a dozen subjects here in Santa Barbara. It was a different type of algorithm. What you're seeing is these trials were 24-hour trials. So two, three meals, maybe an exercise bout, overnight in the clinic. These were all in-clinic studies. Here's what the blood sugar looks like as we try to keep them in the zone. This is that green zone. And what you see is that, again, 70% throughout the entire trial, but overnight, 86%. Approaching 90% of the time, overnight, we're in the tight zone. This is important because overnight is when the subjects are unaware of their condition, especially children. We don't want children crashing and going low overnight. This is a big challenge for the parents. So to have tight control overnight was a a very important part of the study. We're up to almost 46% of the time in that tight, tight, small part of the green zone, almost two thirds of the time in the overnight window. So these were all in clinic, roughly 24 hour trials over the course of the last several years. What we need to do though is get outside the clinic. In the clinic is not a practical solution. We've got to get to free living conditions. So our most recent phase of trials have moved us from uh, more constrained, focused in clinic studies to literally getting outside the clinic. And this is now the realization of that software, that chip. And I think, Al, maybe you've got a tablet with you here. 
maybe, maybe not. So a mini tablet is running our uh, brains, if you will, in somebody's fanny pack while they're wearing a pump and a sensor undergoing this closed loop trial. So let me show you the run up to actually doing this here in Santa Barbara. We started with a consortium, four places, University of Virginia, Padua, Italy, Montpellier, France, and the Sansom Diabetes Research Institute to run these overnight outpatient trials. So eating dinner in a restaurant, sleeping in a hotel, not constrained to a clinic bed. And in Europe, they were able to do closed loop overnight. In the US, the FDA made us run a safety mode overnight. They wouldn't let us keep the feedback loop on. They made us turn the feedback off because they were still very nervous about overnight control. So this was our first pilot. This was about three years ago. And here I show you a snapshot of one of the subjects. So here's a uh, Santa Barbara trivia question. Where's this guy standing? The Mac store on State Street. You recognize that. These guys that are um, striking a bowling pose are at what restaurant? David Arnoldi's. They're doing, they're doing uh, bocce at uh, Arnoldi's. While they're wearing our device, so having a free living day, this guy actually went into the Mac store, jumped on the cloud, downloaded his data, and saw the real-time plot of where his blood sugars were. So this is where we have uh, advanced with the work. So now, that, as I told you, the FDA was not letting us close the loop overnight. Two years ago now, a year and a half ago, we finally got approval from the FDA to take the, the latest generation of our algorithms and really run this overnight. So we're going to collect five days of data from the subject as they're at home, fine tune, learn their characteristics, come into the clinic for four hours, have lunch, close our feedback loop, send them out now for a restaurant dinner overnight in the hotel under pure feedback control. So this is the first place anywhere in the US that the loop has been officially closed outpatient for a long period like this, so a 30-hour trial. And we just wrapped this up at the end of last summer. Here are a couple of the subjects walking down State Street down here, uh, walking through the woods of Virginia for our cohort in Virginia. And we had a cohort at the Mayo Clinic as well. Not quite the same weather that our folks were enjoying here. And so here's just a quick snapshot to show you. We have, uh, we're in the process of publishing these results, so these are very preliminary. But what I'm showing you that for all of those subjects, 34 subjects, over the course of time, the yellow band here is that green zone again, you see that we got remarkable control. The middle line is the mean, the um, lines above and below are the 25 percentile intervals. This is through dinner, a nighttime snack, breakfast, an exercise session, we call it unannounced because the controller doesn't know about it. The subject simply got on a bike, a treadmill, exercised, and the controller kept them rock steady through that. The overnight period was truly impressive. We really reined things in very nicely. And if you look again at the numbers in the green zone, we're 80% of the time now in the green zone throughout the trial, 92% overnight. So we're really improving the quality of the feedback control here. And over the course then, since we did our first closed loop trial, here's our subject undergoing the very first trial at Sansom in 2007. You see that we have literally had hundreds of subjects worldwide connected to our software platform, our control algorithms, and undergoing closed loop trials. Here's one of the more recent studies that happened um, about a year ago. Here are the sites around the globe that are testing our algorithm or using our software. You see it's quite a uh, wide coverage. Not so great in Asia, uh, but we're working on that. So the last piece of this, before I turn things over to the panel, is I want to just say a word about transitioning. So I'm a, a university professor. I do research, I train students, I train postdocs. But along the way, we develop technology that's exciting. And at the university, as I'm sure many of you know, we have a tech transfer office, it's called TIA, Technology and Industrial Alliances, that works with the faculty, with the researchers to translate that technology. So I wanna give you a few snapshots of how we have tried to take the research project I've described to you and begin to harden that and translate that. So probably at the very simple level, we've taken that code for doing the integrated platform, and we have copyright software. We've licensed this now to over a dozen places around the globe. Lots of clinical trials are using that software in their studies. We created an IP bundle around this notion of so-called zone model predictive control, keeping the control in the green zone as an objective. And those were the studies that I was just showing you with the outpatient work. So, Patents and patent applications that have been licensed to a, 
a third party that I can't uh, disclose the name of, but a, a large company that is now taking and translating this technology to a product. We also work with other campuses, and in particular we've enjoyed a consortium with uh, Stanford and have developed some capability for an automatic pump shutoff. This is down on the lower end of that JDRF roadmap of simply shutting the pump down if blood sugars get too low overnight. From that, we've generated IP, and in this case, it was co-developed with Stanford, and their tech transfer office is now working on marketing this piece of IP. And the other bundle that's very exciting is a large number of pieces of IP that came out of the lab around personalizing the algorithm, customizing to the individual, putting wrappers for safety on top of the system, have been bundled and put together and are being licensed to AGC, and Tom is gonna to say a little bit more about the vision of AGC and what they're hoping to do with this technology. So let me wrap up by saying that I think this field of feedback control is gonna let us engineer that artificial pancreas and, and we're within reach. This was a, a tongue-in-cheek cartoon that somebody did about the eye pancreas that, you know, you can imagine there'll be an app for that. This is, it's really coming. From the engineering side, what are we bringing to the puzzle? We bring model predictive control, technology that has been running oil refineries for 30 or 40 years. We've figured out how to innovate that and bring that to the medical domain. We've tailored the models we use to describe patients and we've put the right safety envelopes to protect from things like overdosing the insulin. Lots and lots of challenges, and I, I know Tom will touch on a few of these as well. Some of them are technical, some of them are medical and relate to just the individual, variability, site issues. Some are gonna be the inevitable regulatory, particularly as we move closer to market with a product. Lots and lots of challenges, lots of new things coming down the pike as well. The Google Lens, who knows where that's gonna lead. Maybe that'll have a role in this but lots of interesting innovations that are happening that I think touch on this, this footprint of the artificial pancreas. Okay, let me thank the important people, the folks in the lab who spent long hours working on this. There's our team at UCSB. Um, a lot of the collaborators we've enjoyed through the years, Lois Ivanovich and Howard Zisser at Sansom, were the first clinical doctors I really got to work with on this project, and that was transformational. We work with lots of places around the globe. There's a lot of people that have funded this from the Army, the National Institutes of Health, JDRF, Lots of companies who work with us and bring equipment and supplies. But perhaps one of the most important groups of people that have been just terrific to work with are the subjects here in Santa Barbara who have worked with us, who have uh, been patient with the engineers as we try these ideas out, who um, we learn from, we learn tremendously from as they share with us their experiences in using this. And I'll leave this last slide up here and I'll call this a, uh, a Where's Waldo contest. One of the folks on that board there in the pictures is here in the room, so I'll let you try to find out who that is and talk with them later in the evening. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Frank. That was a wonderful introduction to the subject of artificial pancreas. Um, I, I have known Frank for uh, um, 15 years, 15 years probably. Uh, I, I had a different approach to working in this field. Uh, both of us long ago were interested in the artificial pancreas. There were really two pieces of the artificial pancreas that were missing at the time that Frank and I became active in this area of research. One was the algorithm, uh, which Frank has worked on, and the other was the continuous glucose monitor, which I worked on. Um, what I want to tell you about today is sort of the convergence of technology development in continuous glucose monitoring and algorithms and just in general level of technology and regulatory that now make it possible, uh, in my opinion, and I think in Frank's, to commercialize technologies based on artificial pancreas within the next five years. So uh, just as Frank uh, began his talk with an introduction to diabetes, I too uh, would like to have a, make a few introductory remarks um, I thought I would focus more on the history of diabetes. Um, I think it's possible to think of diabetes in four distinct time periods or epochs. Before the discovery of insulin in 1921, after the discovery of insulin and before something called the DCCT, which is an acronym for one of the most famous uh, clinical studies done in, in medical history, it stands for the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial. And then after DCC, up until now, sort of the present period in diabetes therapy, which 
began in 1993 and I think will last for another couple of years. But then, uh, hopefully, uh, beginning 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, the era of uh, closed loop, or I think a more apt term for it, um, is automated glucose control. So before 1921, and before the discovery of insulin by Banting and Best, uh, diabetes was an invariably fatal disease. Patients suffered from persistent hyperglycemia and literally starved to death because their body lacked the insulin, uh, the, uh, the chemical that opened up the cells uh, to be able to utilize glucose. So this is a picture of a young girl who was diagnosed with diabetes uh, in 1920. She's near death. She was administered, diabetes, administered insulin in 1922. And uh, th this is what she looked like three months later. So um, of course, Frank alluded to the history of the Sansom Diabetes Clinic, uh, which was the first place in the United States to administer insulin. There's a very good book about this. It's probably available at your local Santa Barbara library. Uh, but you, you read about the, you know, the people who are literally brought from death's door uh, by the discovery of insulin and by the administration of insulin injections. But it turns out that insulin was not a cure to diabetes. It, it made it possible for people to survive. But they did so with wildly fluctuating uh, blood glucose. This is a picture of an early insulin bottle uh, this is before the major manufacturers started making the insulin. This, if you can see it, uh, it says uh, Connaught Laboratory, University of Toronto. Um, it's an interesting story about the development of insulin in the United States. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the pre-patent, uh, pre-big pharma era. Uh, Dr. Sansom uh, had I think by his count, 11 or 12 patients at death's door in his clinic, and he had heard about the discovery of insulin in Toronto and called up uh, Banting and said, can I get some insulin? And Banting said, I'd love to give it to you, but we're having a hard time making it. And so over the phone, uh, he dictated to Sansom uh, the recipe for how to make insulin. And Sansom went out. He was trained originally as a biochemist, and he went out and made insulin, uh, which he harvested from um, a slaughterhouse somewhere down in LA. It's a, it's a fascinating story, but insulin didn't cure diabetes. And in fact, people with uh, people in this intermediate era, the era from 1921 to 1993, uh, suffered frequent and severe both acute and chronic complications. It was known as the era of complications, and some of them Frank alluded to, blindness, kidney disease, amputation. Uh, in general, uh, people found a reduced lifespan of about 20 years uh, after the diagnosis of diabetes. This is the New England Journal article that I uh, referred to. It's uh, amongst physicians, amongst uh, people in the medical uh, business like myself. Uh, it's a very noteworthy paper. It's the most cited paper uh, in modern medicine. Uh, it was 1,400 and 41 subjects, half of whom were on a program of intense uh, insulin therapy. The other half just were using the normal conventional therapy. And what they found is that if in the patients who were on the intensive insulin therapy, they had reduced mean or average glucose and reduced complications. So this ushered in the new era. It led to improved glucose monitoring and insulin delivery. It led to blood glucose meters. It became very widespread. It led to the area that I worked on, continuous glucose monitors, it led to the insulin pumps that Frank alluded to. But still with it came, again, what Frank alluded to, this very high burden of decision making. And now, not only do people have to make decisions around each meal, but they have to make continuous decisions to try to keep reducing the blood glucose to near normal levels without, as Frank alluded to, overshooting and having low blood sugar. And so there still was a risk for acute and chronic complications. I just read this paper a few days ago. It came out in, in the January, I, I guess last week, uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a report on life, uh, life expectancy in a group of patients from Scotland uh, with type 1 diabetes. And what they found is that even with all of the advances that have occurred in the last 70 years in diabetes and in medicine, 
Uh, on average, uh, males with diabetes have 11 years shorter lifespan than their cohorts without diabetes, and females have a 13 year shorter lifespan. So I think it's, it speaks to not only the burden of the disease, but the fact that you know, people aren't doing as well as they could be with current technology. So the, the new era, uh, I think, is the era of automated glucose control. Uh, I put a question mark there because I think you know, those of us who are developing the technology uh, don't know for sure when uh, these devices can be made commercially available, but we think uh, somewhere in the next four to five years is a reasonable estimate. Uh, I was asked uh, last year uh, to write a review paper for the New York Academy of Sciences on the current state and future prospects uh, in the management of diet for our, the artificial pancreas and the management of diabetes. I worked with uh, Dr. DeSau from UC Santa Barbara. I worked with Jay Schuyler, a very famous endocrinologist from Miami University in Florida, and I worked with Dr. Marc Breton from uh, University of Virginia. And we came to the conclusion after reviewing the literature uh, and writing this paper that uh, artificial pancreas was really a mature technology. Um, and that, that view has subsequently you know, been echoed by the JAMA article. Uh, there was an article in, in the leading diabetes journal and diabetes care. There have been recent papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I think this era is upon us. And what will this era bring? It brings near normal blood glucose. It brings a reduced burden of decision making. Uh, I think we have the potential to reduce or even eliminate most, if, if not all, of the acute and chronic complications of the disease. And of course, uh, the opportunity to give people a normal uh, lifespan. But artificial pancreas has been a focus of research in academia for a long time, as Frank said, over 40 years. This is a interesting schematic of an early artificial pancreas device. This was from a paper that appeared in 1974. It was called the Biostator. And um, you can see the device is a little bit larger than the patient. This isn't exactly something uh, you would take home with you. But it begs the question of you know, why it's taken so long. Uh, and we'll go through the different components uh, in this and try to understand what the problem has been and how it's been solved in recent years. So there really are, in my mind, there are four reasons why artificial pancreas technology has taken so long. The first is there weren't portable insulin pumps. And I'm also going to show you the famous picture of the guy with the backpack pump, um, something, you know, I think just by way of comparison to show how far we've come in recent years. But there were no portable insulin infusion devices. This is a picture of a patient on an artificial pancreas in the 1970s. Uh, as you can see, the, the artificial pancreas is uh, larger than the patient. Um, there were no glucose sensor technologies. Uh, to measure glucose in those days, you had to withdraw the blood, measure it uh, on the spot with a large chemical laboratory apparatus, and then hand enter the, the number into the machine. Um, the algorithms that have been developed to control uh, blood glucose were not, were not specific to, to diabetes. Um, they, they were just sort of the best guesses the doctors had at the time. They were basically lookup tables. Uh, and needless to say, the regulatory bodies, FDA in particular, had what I think were extremely legitimate concerns about the safety and reliability of these kinds of technologies. So what's happened in the intervening years? As Frank said, miniature insulin pumps are now in widespread use. There are new continuous glucose monitoring systems, the most recent generations of which are extremely accurate and extremely reliable. And again, I think there are a few people in the audience who may be using them. There have been over 15 years of research on algorithms uh, that have brought the, the best thinking from control theory and control engineering to diabetes and repeated clinical studies that have shown these are effective. And finally, at the FDA, there's a new enthusiasm for the potential of artificial pancreas devices, uh, not only to be effective, but to be safe. And the FDA has been, uh, in recent years, a real partner uh, to researchers like myself and Frank who are trying to develop this technology. I apologize for the repeat of the backpack, but it, it's interesting to look at the different insulin pump technologies that are available now for multiple companies, uh, Medtronic, Insulet, Asante, 
uh, and Tandem Diabetes, just to name a few of the more prominent manufacturers. Continuous glucose monitors were first developed uh, in the late 90s. They were very inaccurate. Uh, this is a plot of the average error, which um, the technical term for that is the mean absolute relative difference, but it's just the average error. Uh, early devices that were first approved by the FDA in 2005 had an average error of 30 percent. Doesn't sound so bad. But the, the, the safe zone in diabetes is pretty small. So if your blood sugar is, a, is you know, 150, um, 30 percent error means that, you know, your, the sensor could read 100, which would be fine, or it could read 200, which, is, which might cause you to give insulin. So large errors. Over the years, as this graph shows, um, a number of companies played a very prominent role in improving the accuracy. I worked at Dexcom for a number of years as the VP of Science and Technology, uh, and the latest Dexcom sensor, which, is, which was approved by the FDA in November, uh, it's called the Dex, Dexcom G4AP. It was originally developed in part uh, from conversations that I had with Frank and Dr. Dassau who continue to complain about the poor accuracy of the, of the Dexcom sensors. Uh, and so we made one that is now finally um, almost as accurate or, or as accurate as blood glucose meters. So a lot of the barriers uh, have, that I alluded to that stood in the way of progress in the early 1970s have gone away. Um, finally, the, you know, the work that Frank has described, uh, beginning with a very prominent paper in 1996. This is the first paper that I'm aware of that looked at application of engineering methods to diabetes. Uh, there was a follow-up paper published three years later. Um, I remember uh, working in the field at the time, um, working on artificial pancreas prototype devices and being very taken aback by this paper. So it was nice to finally meet Frank a few years later. And then finally, the FDA. Um, FDA used to think of artificial pancreas as something that could only hurt people if it went wrong. And beginning around four years ago, five years ago, there was a change in thinking at the most senior level of the FDA. And they began to think that they could play a pro more proactive role in encouraging uh, researchers in academia and researchers in industry in trying to develop systems that were, that were safe uh, from the start. They issued this guidance document in 2012. It's very significant because they're basically laid out in an 80-page document to researchers like myself and Frank what we needed to do to convince them that our proposed technologies were safe and effective. So that's a big change. So lots of good things have happened over the last few years, but the question still remained or still remains, what are the challenges for commercializing the technology? Why haven't more insulin pump companies you know, jumped uh, onto the technology that was developed at Santa Barbara and other, and other uh, universities and tried to develop uh, systems like Frank and I have been describing? I think there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, the most important is that uh, insulin pump companies are focused on their current business out of necessity. Uh, they have you know, it's a very competitive uh, commercial landscape, um, and it's hard to set aside the, the large amount of R&D that's gone into the development of the intellectual property at a place like uh, UC Santa Barbara. So they, they have not been able as well to put together the technical teams. I mean, Frank, you have a dozen people or so you know, working on this, many of whom have worked on it for, for, for a long, long time. Most of the research on closed loop algorithms has been in academia, not in industry. So I saw uh, about a year ago an opportunity to create a company that could provide a bridge between industry and academia. Um, so our vision at Automated Glucose Control is to create a practical and feasible artificial pancreas device corresponding roughly to, again, what Frank alluded to in his talk, stage four of the JDRF artificial pancreas pathway, sometimes called an automated basal or hybrid closed loop. And so what we mean by that is a system that will do fully automated glucose control overnight, 
the data from clinical studies using the Santa Barbara algorithm suggests that it's easy to achieve a mean glucose overnight of 110 uh, with very little fluctuation, similar to the curves that, that Frank showed. That would be a huge advantage for people, a huge boon to people uh, with diabetes. And then we thought instead of promising them that we would control everything during the day, we would focus instead on trying to apply the algorithms to assist them uh, in improving the glucose control during the day. So it's fully automated overnight and assisted control during the day. We've, my, my colleague, um, Dr. Jennifer Schneider in Palo Alto and I have uh, approached a number of insulin pump companies and proposed to them a program where we would provide software uh, derived from the Santa Barbara research that had been rewritten and basically productized in a form that could be rapidly embedded in, a, in an insulin pump. We need to do that under special rules that don't apply to researchers. So when, when the codes that were written in Santa Barbara and put onto the tablet, they were done very carefully and very meticulously, but they weren't designed from scratch as a commercial product. So we will actually take the intellectual property from Santa Barbara and rewrite it under all the specific rules that are required to meet FDA um, approval. We also are gonna sit down, and we've already begun to do so, and anticipate all of the possible hazards. What could go wrong with the system? So we have to build safety in from the very beginning. It's one thing to do a clinical study in a supervised uh, uh, environment. It's another thing uh, to have a product that's being used by tens or hundreds of thousands of patients day in and day out. It's sort of the difference between a, um, an, an aircraft, which is developed and flown by a test pilot, um, who's very trained, compared to a commercial aviation. So we're about to make the transition into, into the commercial aviation uh, you know, analogy with artificial pancreas. And to do that, we have to think a lot about what could go wrong, and we have to build safety into the system from scratch. And so we're, we're interested in collaborating with the pump companies on that, um, we, we will help them design and execute clinical studies to show safety and efficacy, and we'll work with them as well on the clinical studies and on the regulatory submissions. So to conclude, I think really a new epoch, a new era of diabetes is now within reach. Um, the two major advances over the last decade have been in continuous glucose monitoring and in algorithms that now permits the transition to commercial products Interestingly, uh, I believe the insulin pump companies are now ready to develop automated glucose control devices. The FDA is, as I said, very positive and very supportive about automated glucose control. And I think it will be possible to make products, to run clinical studies, and to get them approved and on the market within the next five years. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a couple of uh, circulating microphones. If, you're, if you have one, can you stand up and let us know where you are? Um, but before we open up the floor for questions, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask our asper experts, which immediately came to mind from the presentations. So um, the first one is, so when can individuals actually buy this? And understanding that perhaps this is, uh, means more than one thing. And also given that individuals with diabetes range a lot from uh, young children to teens to adults, all walks of life, who are going to be the, do you think, are going to be the first users of this technology? Maybe I'll, I'll... Thanks, uh, I'll take this since I'm attempting to commercialize the technology, and that really is a question about commercialization. I'm hopeful that we can, we can get FDA approval within the next five years. However, it's important to add that we will not, um, we will not want to sell a product unless we have 100% confidence, not only in its efficacy, but in its safety. And to really be comfortable about safety for a product like this, 
you have to do clinical studies. And the clinical studies can take a long time. So we put together a pretty detailed project plan that involves a pretty exhaustive set of clinical studies. I reviewed them in part today with Frank, uh, but it could take longer. So you know, I think it's possible to, that people could buy this in five years. It's possible it could take seven years. It seems unlikely to me that it would take 10 years. So I would say five to 10 years. Um, there's a, a huge amount of clinical study data developed to date that is actually very promising, both in terms of safety and efficacy. So I'm hoping for five years. I think it can certainly be done within 10 years, to your first question. Um, for the second question, who, who will get to use this technology uh, initially? Um, FDA has a pretty strong policy, again, related to safety, that they want products like this to be tested and evaluated first in adults. And again, I completely uh, support that and completely uh, understand that perspective. Having said that, there are many studies uh, that Frank alluded to, many of the studies that he showed on his graph were done in adolescents and in children. Um, there, I participated in a study over the last two summers at a diabetes camp where the youngest children were six years old. So I think it's, I think the first products that people will, that will be available uh, will probably be approved for, for people ages 18 to and above or possibly ages 15 and above. I think FDA will want some evidence in, in additional clinical studies in children uh, before the product is approved, but at most that would delay it. Frank, what do you think, a year? Yeah, a year or two. So. <clears throat> I, I would augment one thing on the technology. So there are a lot of people who refer to the artificial pancreas, and as both Tom and I showed, there's this pathway that the JDRF has put out there. And it's important to understand that there's not just one artificial pancreas. So there are many companies working on this. They have various degrees of automation. And at the far left end of that roadmap, the stage one, there actually are products that are creeping in the market now. So there are low glucose suspend systems that are available from one of the vendors right now. So the beginnings of this automation are happening. It's nowhere near the kind of automation we've been testing in clinical trials, but the technology is creeping in. It is beginning to get regulatory approval. It's getting hardened by companies. We're, we're getting closer. And my second question is, should there be an implantable version of this? It's getting pretty small. Should I try that one? Uh, uh, there should be. Um, the question is whether there can be. Um, there, there's some advantages to implanting a system like this. Uh, one is you don't have to wear it on your body. Um, more importantly, if you implant an insulin pump, it turns out that it works better. Uh, having said that, there are other problems associated with implanted technologies. The body doesn't like to have foreign substances. The body tries to reject implants, it encapsulates implants. It takes much longer to develop the technology. So I think the right path is uh, with an external insulin pump, an external sensor, uh, try to achieve a level of automation that Frank and I have described, and then over the next 10 to 15 years, see what can be done with implanted technology. I don't know, Frank? Yeah, I would echo that entirely. And again, remember, I represent kind of the university research view, so we do tend to look a little further down the road at things that are um, in the research realm, we're dreaming a little bit. So we have been doing clinical trials um, in that direction. One uh, series of trials has been in France, with a version of a pump where you actually have a piece of tubing that goes into the body, so it's a minor um, thoracic surgery, and um, that squirts the insulin in the peritoneal cavity, in the cavity where the pancreas would dump insulin. And we have seen improvement from that, but that technology is only available right now in a couple of countries in the globe, but it's looking ahead to what if we could get it in the body faster, what's the improvement, what's the, uh, the benefit. And the other aspect is we have a grant from the NIH to look at a fully implantable device. Um, this would start actually in animal studies initially because this would be, a, uh, again, potentially dangerous, as Tom pointed out, um, technology if the insulin were dumped 
in the body. There have been attempts at this in the past by Medtronic. So we are beginning to do early phase um, studies with a fully implantable version where you've got the device completely in the body. But again, academic research, early days, 10 to 15 would be generous, I think, to say that that might translate into a product in the market. But remember that that's a much more complicated surgical procedure. These are basically devices that I've shown you here you can pick up and you can place on your body without a, uh, an expert or a doctor doing that. The implantable version is a far more invasive procedure. Okay, so let's open it up for questions from the audience. A question here. Okay. Um, thank you for a great presentation, and I actually wanted to direct a question to Fred, um, more from the investor perspective. So as, as was mentioned many times, getting FDA approval and um, takes an enormous amount of time and money and then moving towards um, insurance and reimbursement and things like that are huge tasks. And often what happens is um, the initial investors get washed out of the process. So I'm hoping you can address that question a little bit and talk about the challenges. Very good question and one I have some experience with. The, um, but before I take the question on, I want to compliment Frank and uh, Thomas, uh, not so much for their presentation, but for the work they've done over the years, uh, which is uh, obviously highly demanding and uh, very frustrating, and now uh, facing the even more, more difficult task of um, dealing with the FDA, but necessary task. So congratulations to you guys. So I can give you a couple of examples. There's a company, uh, it was actually the first venture investment I made in Santa Barbara in a company called Centair. And sales of uh, cookies in airports skyrocket when they're baking them and drop when they're, when they're not. So Centair was a little package of uh, 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 material that was electrically electrically stimulated to produce an a, uh, odor. And it turns out that there are companies that make those fragrances. And um, I got uh, talked into joining the board and made a small investment in it, which I wrote off about 15, uh, probably 10 years ago. And uh, uh, we, were, we sold the company, not all, you know, 90% of it, and got really squeezed because we were running out of cash and there was no new angel money. And uh, lo and behold, the people who bought it have it in 95 countries now and sold it on uh, December 30th and I got a big check uh, for more than a 10 to one return. So uh, uh, I would say one lesson is you gotta have staying power if you're going to do it. Now this is highly, you know, the time frames that these uh, two gentlemen have described uh, makes it that daunting. Now, there's another company that actually was based on USB, UCSB technology, originally Cytomics, and it was split in two. We have John, at least one investor here, John Patoti, uh, and we were squeezed down uh, about five years ago by Third Rock capital, which is, uh, was originally based in Boston, still is. But they were the people who built Millennium Pharmaceutical. And so the original angel investors um, uh, ended up with uh, about 10% of the company. Uh, Cytomics just now, during J.P. Morgan's uh, week, uh, completed a uh, financing at a pre-money of 110, post-money of 130 million, and led by Pfizer. And uh, Pfizer has also done a joint venture with us to develop four drugs, where they gave us $25 million up front, no equity, just for the right to do it. And um, 200, uh, well, 635 million in bio bucks, which means meeting my milestones, which I guess 40 to 60 percent is. Um, uh, and we have, did last year a deal with um, BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, 50 million up front, again, to collaborate on four drugs. 
Uh, so it's biotech, so you never really know, but uh, uh, the original investors, the angels who are perhaps getting a little impatient at this point, uh, can look forward to the possibility of a very, very large return. Fundamentally, uh, what, what cytomics does is allow uh, antibodies to be targeted only at the disease tissues. Therefore, the side effects are minimized. And very fortunate, by the way, luck is good too. Uh, fortunately for us, the uh, newest cancer technologies are uh, actually designed to kill the cancer, not block a pathway. And therefore, delivering it to the right place is very important. And uh, that's what led to the Pfizer BMS collaborations. So uh, I, I think the long winded answer to your question, but uh, if you're an angel investor, you better do it with money. You don't really uh, need uh, uh, to do it. And be prepared, it may be a long, long time before you get it back. Rob from Pacificos Business Times. Frank, thanks for talking to me last week for my column. Uh, I had real, just sitting here thinking about this, this is software, so it really doesn't cost very much to replicate, and if you were to move it across two or three million or 10 million patients, the cost would be relatively low on an incremental basis if it got widespread approval. So I uh, guess, how do you price it? How do you get paid for it? And then I kind of had a qu follow-up question, but how do you price it? How do you get paid for it? Let me start with uh, one tack on that, and then mm -hmm. Tom, you can speak to the finances. So, so this is the field I come from, feedback control, which is often called the invisible technology because it truly is in everything, your watch, your phone, the thermostat in the wall, your car, flight controls, et cetera. So it's, it's a truly cheap component of the system. It's a chip, it's a piece of software, it's very scalable, very reproducible, far cheaper than the manufacturing cost of almost any system you would put feedback control on. So it's tremendous value add for a very modest um, raw material, if you will, cost. So that's intrinsic to all feedback control systems, not just the artificial pancreas, but all feedback control. Now how you monetize that, we need someone smart like Tom to, to tell us then how that works. Yeah, well, unfortunately, it's not completely up to me. Uh, we live in a in a world where their uh, healthcare is uh, healthcare expenditures are carefully controlled, despite the rising uh, premiums that we all pay. But healthcare expenditures are carefully controlled by insurance companies, and it takes a lot to uh, to get new technologies approved uh, for reimbursement. The key to getting new technologies approved for reimbursement, however, is that you have to show something called the health economic benefit. You have to show that the insurance companies will make more money with this technology than without. And in the case of diabetes technology, everything that we've learned since the TCCT study that I mentioned uh, is that better glucose control reduces complications and reduces costs. And so what we find when we talk to the insurance companies and when we talk to uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, which is the government healthcare um, cost control center, um, they're very excited about artificial pancreas. Um, now, I don't think this technology will be approved for what's called premium pricing when it's first available. But, and the reason is that w we will do the minimum number of clinical studies required to get FDA approval. Once the product is approved, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper to do long-term clinical studies to really demonstrate the health economic benefit. So I suspect that the initial products, the first generation products, will just be sort of tagged on as software in existing insulin pumps. And then as we can show the, the benefit and the fact that people who can control their blood sugar to have an average blood sugar of 110 or 120, they have less hospital admissions, they have less uh, long-term complications, they need less you know, uh, laser surgeries to, rep to repair their eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, once we can show that data, which probably takes a study that runs a few years, uh, then I think it will be possible to get what's called premium pricing. I, ho I hope that answered your question. Well, yeah, it did, but it leads to my follow-up question, which is, you can sort of see this friction where the insurance companies and the regulators really like this, right? But speaking cynically, the pump makers 
and the glucose or insulin sellers, they don't because you're shutting the thing off at night, it lasts twice as long, blah, blah, blah. Um, so how do you see the, the sort of the industry politics in this playing out? Um, because there's a little bit of friction here. You're, you're installing a device on a pump that's going to make it work better. Yeah, I, but actually, uh, the, no, I think it's a, it's a really great question. Um, but the guys who are selling, it's like but, uh, a razor blade uh, that lasts twice as long. Yeah, no, uh, but it's a great question. But if you, if you actually look at the details of the data, what, what the algorithm that Frank and his colleagues have developed does, uh, does, does not change the amount of insulin that's given in the course of a day which is very interesting, but it changes the timing of the insulin, and it turns out that it's all about timing. Um, if you give the insulin at the right time and the right amount, you can be very effective. So I think the insulin manufacturers you know, have nothing to fear from, from Frank Doyle and his colleagues. Um, as for the insulin pump manufacturers, they too have nothing to fear from Frank Doyle and his colleagues. And the reason is that insulin pumps are now only used by about 20 25% of the patient population who could benefit from them. Continuous glucose sensors are used by only about 10% of the patients. And the reason is, it's a lot of hassle, it's a lot of trouble, it's a lot of work, and it's only a small number of people who can really take advantage of existing technology and get huge benefit from it. So what we're, what we're trying to do, and Frank and I have had many, many, many conversations about this, by, by making, peop, by making uh, some of the decisions in the microprocessor, we make it easier for people to use pumps and to use sensors and to be effective. So, for example, there are probably 500,000 people uh, today in the United States who use insulin pumps out of four million who could benefit from it. Um, I think a technology like this could double and triple the, the market for insulin pumps within a few years. I'll just say one final thing about that, and, and that has to do with the medical community. Right now, doctors would like to prescribe the fancy glucose sensors that, that I worked on. They'd like to prescribe the pumps that others have worked on to all their patients, but not all their patients will do better. And in fact, a lot of times, um, the patients will call up and they'll complain to the doctor, the sensor hurts when I insert it, I, I don't know what to do with the data, uh, I can't figure out how to, how to give the right amount of insulin with my pumps. Uh, and so it's a hassle for them. If you make a system that's easy for people to use and easy for people to use successfully, I think doctors will prescribe it more and I think it will be more used by, by a greater portion of the population. May I make a comment? Yes, please. So Novo Nordisk, a Scandinavian company, makes most of the insulin. And if in fact, Thomas, your surmise is correct, that it will, if you increase the market share, of uh, in, uh, insulin, got more people on it, I would think Novo Nordisk would be very interested in, in, uh, in that idea. So my question to you, to you both would be, shouldn't you be working a little bit more closely with no Novo Nordisk? Yeah, any contacts you can give me to call, <laughs> I'd appreciate it. I think you call them up, I mean, I wouldn't be bashful. <laughs> We have the next question right here. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everybody. Very interesting uh, presentations. You've talked about this for type 1 diabetes. Are there apl applications to people with type 2 diabetes that are using insulin? So there's a fraction, a small fraction, though, the subjects who have type 2 diabetes that would benefit from insulin therapy. Um, by and large, it's really nutrition and exercise for individuals with type 2. So I think um, more pharmaceutical research, the kind of work that Fred's involved in, and um, drug discovery is really the frontier that people are hoping to conquer for type 2 for the large uh, portion of the population. But certainly there are um, individuals with type 2, there are individuals who um, have had their pancreas removed, perhaps pancreatic cancer, who could benefit from insulin dosing. So there are other, other opportunities beyond individuals with type 1, but considerably smaller uh, demographic. I th there's a very interesting study uh, that w was published in The Lancet a number of years ago where they took patients with t newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, a couple hundred patients, half of them they hospitalized for one month 
put them on insulin, which regularized their blood sugar for one month. The other half they sent home with normal care. At the end of the year, and then they, after the month, the patients who had been in the hospital on insulin got sent home. And what they discovered is that a year or two years later, the people who had gotten insulin early and then gone off it had done a lot better. And so that's a very active area of research in type 2 diabetes. And it, there's this hypothesis that high blood sugar, which is caused by diabetes in, in, in type 2 diabetes, then destroys the pancreatic beta cells and leads to a worsening of the disease. So there is a potential for using this technology, I think, uh, to arrest the progression of type 2 diabetes, but that's still in the research stage. And actually, if I could add to that, there's one other application that we've been in discussions with some doctors in LA about, which is the procedure of transplanted islets. So one um, therapy for type 1 diabetes would be to transplant islets um, into an individual with type 1 and hope that they would take and not be rejected by the body. The transition from the initial transplant to getting productive beta cells is a, a rocky period of a couple days, and the doctors have approached us about using the artificial pancreas to bridge that window to maybe supplement that insulin so that the beta cells that are transplanted are more viable. So there are a number of different ways that you could spin this to support other problems like the kind that Tom mentioned. I think we have a question here. Hi, Paul Strasma. I'm an entrepreneur in the glucose sensor space and a former colleague of Tom's. Um, I guess nice, my nice question to, is following nice up. To see you, Paul. Good to see Tom. <laughs> To follow up on the industry dynamics, I thought you might want to talk a little bit more about the fact that there's two sensor companies, four pump companies that kind of dominate this space, have their own technologies already that they're building on. Um, how do you foresee this developing? Is this going to be something that's licensed out to one of those dominant players? Is this something that there's a business model to actually serve multiple competitors all trying to gain a leg up on one another? Yeah, uh, I've known Paul for many years, and he always asks hard questions, particularly to me. Uh, no, I mean, our, our vision actually is to develop software that could reside in any insulin pump from any insulin pump company. So it's sort of, um, I believe in business school, it's referred to as the Intel inside model. Um, and the reason I think that's a reasonable strategy here is that there, there are three or four insulin pump companies. They're all differentiated by the different visions that the pump companies have about how to best deliver insulin. The, the, the video that Frank showed is from a company called Insulet, which is based outside of Boston. And they, they have been proponents of an insulin pump without tubes um, and that uses a remote controller to give insulin. Another company called Tandem that is based in San Diego has taken the traditional insulin pump that was developed in the 90s by Minimed and then Medtronic and they've put sort of an iPhone look and feel. They've made a touch screen, they've made a very intuitive user interface. That's another approach. Um, another company called Asante Solutions up in the Bay Area has an insulin pump that's extremely easy for people to use. So I think the pump, there, there is room for differentiating pump companies based on their unique vision of how to make pumping as effective and as um, easy an experience for patients as possible. But all of them need the kind of, the kind of algorithms that Frank and Dr. DeSalle have developed. So I think there is an opportunity to provide this, this bridge, this translation to more than one company. In terms of glucose sensing, um, there are two companies that currently make uh, glucose sensors, Dexcom, my former company, and Medtronic. Um, there are more companies in the wings. Um, I think they're likely to be, you know, you know, a half dozen or so companies that make competitive glucose sensor products uh, over the next you know, five or 10 years. And any one of them can participate in, a, in an artificial pancreas. One of the main drivers is gonna be companies that make uh, continuous glucose sensors that are not only accurate and reliable, but that are cheap. And so there's a op great opportunity for a new company to be formed. Uh, I don't know if we haven't talked in a few months, but for a new company to be formed that could make a, a low-cost continuous glucose monitor. Frank, you 
give your opinion of that kind of business model. I think it's interesting to say we're serving um, many different um, you know, technologies and trying to be the middle player. Have you had experience with companies that have that as a business model? Uh, you know, I'm not sure I fully understand the, uh, uh, in the question, but the things, the thoughts that are going through my mo mo mind as I you know, listen to the d discussion is that the uh, majority of the expense in, di in diabetes is not going to be in the uh, delivery vehicle. It's going to be in the insulin th itself over uh, the lifetime of the, of the patient. And if I were uh, competing in this arena, I would be focusing much more on uh, making the case that you made that um, uh, this will, that more people will be using insulin as a result of this, significantly more people, and follow that path to uh, uh, getting it introduced, because that's where I think the majority of the expense is going to be. No charge for this free consulting, by the way. <laughs> My name is Kitch Wilson. I'm a biomedical engineer. I do endocrine system modeling as well as feedback control, although not in glucose. And my question has to do with this is actually a, a two output system. You have glucose and you have insulin and you have glucagon. And you've only talked about insulin. Are you doing anything with glucagon? Yeah, I can address that question. So it, um, it, it's a very interesting point, Kitch, that you make, that we've reduced a very complex medical problem, a physiological problem, to a one input, one output problem. We're measuring blood sugar and we're delivering insulin. When in fact, as you correctly point out, in the body, it's in fact more than one. It's actually probably three or more um, things that are modulated, insulin and glucagon. I mentioned the counter-regulatory pair. There's also um, premletide, um, amylin, which is modulated, and, and it affects the, the digestive process. So the pancreas also secretes that hormone. So there are a multitude of handles Mother Nature uses. Mother Nature also harnesses a, a neural system. So when you walked in and looked at the uh, table with all the appetizers on it, your body started producing insulin, so-called cephalic phase, from a neurally stimulated pathway. So Mother Nature is far more sophisticated in her harnessing of various signals and, and controls for this problem. To your specific question of glucagon, at the present time, there is not a stable formulation of glucagon that can last for long periods outside of, say, a refrigerator at room temperature and a pump. There are a number of very clever individuals working on this, trying to come up with a better formulation of glucagon that can survive in solution for long periods. And I'm confident that that problem will get solved in a matter of years, presumably. But at the present time, it's not feasible to put on a product to go on the market. Right now, glucagon is used by individuals with diabetes as a so-called rescue system. If they get dangerously low, if they crash, they have a store of glucagon in the fridge that they can administer to boost their blood sugars back up by breaking down that glycogen. So I think, again, talking as a university researcher, putting that hat on, the future here, if we get beyond the five-year commercialization of the device we've talked about today, in the 10, the 15, you know, the rest of my academic career, we're gonna be looking at other drugs to administer, potentially glucagon, amylin. Uh, we're also gonna be looking at other measurements. So just relying on a blood sugar measurement, tight and accurate as it has become, is a limited way of thinking as well. We're beginning uh, research in the university looking at exercise as an input, so measuring heart rate, so measuring accelerometry, the intensity of your workout. If we can inform the artificial pancreas that you're about to go on a long run, and furthermore, if we know you've got a history of running at 6 a.m. on alternating days, we can add that information to the artificial pancreas as well. So I think as we continue the research, we're going to harness other measurements, we're going to harness other inputs, and this will become truly a multivariable, multiple input, multiple output kind of control problem. Other questions? And this is my lack of knowledge about logarithms. Oh, I'm sorry. My lack of knowledge on logarithms is, puts me at a distinct disadvantage. I'm a type one, 50 years, and I'm still standing. I'm not saying it's not important. What you're doing is very important. The ups and downs of a type one 
I should have been dead five times in the last 50 years. Easily, ask my wife, excuse me, <laughs> ask the Santa Barbara Police Department who picked me up a month ago in my car, not even knowing where the hell I'm driving. I clocked a 42 blood sugar. I've recorded 23s. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to keep down the sugar. I've been keeping it down too low. Now I try to compensate. I don't want any more incidents with the police department or Cottage Hospital or Francine, my wife. It's very, very difficult. I could buy and invest in everything you're talking about. What I don't understand is the logarithms, how you can do that in a study, a controlled study, and not treat each patient individually. That's where I'm missing this whole thing. I can think my way into a coma just by working too hard, which I do a lot. I don't run six miles a day. I don't eat like a maniac. I'm within 20 pounds of the same weight I was when I was 18 and diagnosed with type 1. So maybe I'm an aberration. Maybe I'm very typical of type 1s. To answer one key question, who should you give this technology to? I read when I first got it at 18. My parents didn't even know what it was. My dad kept calling it sugar diabetes. He had never heard of diabetes. You know, he was a coal miner from uh, Pennsylvania. He didn't know what diabetes was. So I think what I read early on, and maybe this is wishful thinking or 15 years into diagnosis, most doctors I saw said, be very, very careful. You're going to get something that's going to go wrong with you within 12 to 16 years in terms of major complication. I'm sure the 1993 study bore this out. That's where I give the technology to. The newly diagnosed, and not me, the nearly dead, yeah, I've defied gravity, but I did it a couple of ways. I went through hell, and it scared the hell out of me. Economics, I've been self-employed virtually all my life. When I went to Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois to get my insurance, yes, I'm on Medicare now, so now it's all your problem. You're going to pay for me to keep living and living. My insurance premium, just for me, no family, no kids, $21,000 a year because I was C-rated at the time, a type 1 diabetic. This guy's going to be a goner. It's going to cost us a fortune to keep him healthy. Well, they came across, Blue Cross came across, Blue Shield, and I got my money's worth. But the major complication, which I say you need to give this technology to the young people, get them acclimated quickly, I was already 18. Who the hell is going to get, take advice from anybody, scientists or doctors, at 18? I just wanted to go out and drive, drink, and meet girls. Here's the price I paid. 15 years into it, at the age of 32, 33, I lost this eye. Gone. It happened the day before my father died. I couldn't even tell my friends and relatives what happened to me. The question is, give it to the young people, because they're going to get the major complications. I don't care how saintly they seem to be and athletic, they're going to need the help now. The older people, if so, you've survived long with it, you already know what you're doing. and You're very lucky and thank God for it. But the young people, they just think they're, well, if I can't do it on my iPad and my iPhone, <laughs> I ain't going to do anything else. So it, do we... Yes. Thank you very much to Fred Glock for participating. Yeah. And it sounds let, as though the just, question... If I could make just a comment. For, yes. First of all, you know, congratulations. Uh, living with diabetes for 50 years in the, in, the, in, the, in the old days is a great accomplishment. And, it, and I know what a huge amount of effort that took from you and from your wife and your family and friends. So, you know, I, I applaud you. I think there are technologies now, even today, that w could make your life a little bit easier, such as continuous glucose monitoring. You could wear a continuous glucose monitor, and it could sound a beep or an alarm uh, if your blood, when you were driving if your blood sugar got below 70, um, and that could help you. 
I think you, you could benefit from one of these automated glucose control systems, but I agree with you. Um, diabetes is an ep epidemic proportion in children. The age of onset, the, the mean age of onset among children in the last 15 years has gone from 12 to six. So there's something bad happening. And these kids you know, have a long life ahead of them and they would benefit greatly from this technology. But I think so, so would people who have had it for a while. So I, I think there's a huge population that can benefit. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Yeah. I, I was going to add time. to that oh, go ahead, just please. quickly that, I mean, you touch on a really important point when you look at the spectrum of individuals um, who are impacted by type 1 diabetes. And one of the critical things we do as um, engineers on this project that I didn't get into the details of is we personalize the algorithms. So the algorithms are customized up front to the individual's characteristics. So it's not a silver bullet, one size fits all for everybody. There are groups looking at those approaches. There are trade-offs with doing that. They're very conservative. We customize, and furthermore, we continue to learn. The very first clinical trial I did here in Santa Barbara 12 years ago with the folks at Sansom was doing something called run-to-run -run control. Can we learn over the course of a week or two the precise, let's say, insulin to carbohydrate ratio so that you get the right math on the carbohydrates you're about to eat? We learned the individual's numbers. It took a few days but we titrate it, we got just the right customized value. So part of the secret in this technology is gonna be customizing and adapting, learning as the body changes, what are the changing requirements? How does this change week to week, month to month, year to year? That's a big part of the challenge. I think we have time for one more question. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to add a little bit of information to what Jim said. I have a friend who's also been type 1 for 50 years. And he, unlike Jim, is a researcher who had to go into disability 15 years ago. He almost died at uh, A1 to, uh, A1C of 9.8. And I encouraged him to use his research capabilities to try to understand what was happening in his own body. <clears throat> uh, to, to spin to the answer, for the last 10 years, he's been able to hold his A1C uh, at 5.8 to 6, which is perfectly normal. His doctors are amazed at his ability to do this. And uh, in the process, he developed a software algorithm based on a secondary process that he discovered between insulin and his body, which I have no idea is just for him or for everyone, in, in, everyone. but my, uh, my conceptualization of this process is that when you have a feedback system, and you understand this, you have an oscillation factor, you have a damping factor. And when you add insulin to your body, there is still a process that occurs in his body that is countering the effect of the added insulin. So what happens is you add insulin, your blood pressure, com sugar comes down, and then suddenly it turns around and goes up. And he's claimed that he understands why that happens and he can control it. Essentially, he's found a damping factor that averages out this, this uh, process and makes it completely controllable in his case. If you'd like to have some more information about that, I have a write-up on this that I can offer you to read. I have no idea of evaluating. All I know is that the gentleman is looking for some sort of compensation for his 12 years of work. And um, you'll appreciate this. Uh, but I think he's got something very important that I would like to see evaluated in the larger sphere. He had a five-person clinical study at Joplin, they all, every one of those patients was able to improve their regulation. He, and he's doing this without Excuse any, me, perhaps we dish. could uh, continue this discussion so I'll, I'll stop this after, here, the, uh, after the presentation. I hope that somebody in this audience can respond to that input and help me figure this out. Thanks. Perfect. I have uh, one final question for the panelists, unless there's one from the floor. And that is, um, as this technology becomes more available and accessible, where do you see the opportunities for entrepreneurs? We mentioned the eye, the eye pancreas, perhaps an eye, uh, 
uh, an iPhone app? Um, how about extensions to other potential disease management, such as Parkinson's, which, isn't, which is believed to be uh, related to the control of dopamine production in the brain? Where would you see, uh, where are some kind of hotbeds for, uh, for entrepreneurs out there? Well, unfortunately, there are uh, too many diseases uh, and too many problems associated with aging and not enough technology. So there's a huge amount of potential for uh, new companies, new ventures, new startups in all fields. Uh, I'm on the board of a company uh, that is looking at the use of stem cells to address uh, macular degeneration and other retinal diseases. Um, Frank is doing interesting research uh, at the university looking at PTSD, which is a problem not only for returning soldiers, but turns out to be an underlying cause of a lot of the mental health disorders in our society. So there are lots of opportunities. Um, epilepsy is an area where uh, sensing uh, might be very valuable in providing early warning of impending uh, seizures uh, now that there are drugs that can be uh, given uh, to to inhibit seizures. Unfortunately, these drugs are very expensive, uh, and so the sensors have to be accurate and reliable. And so that's an area for future research, J just to name a few. Yeah, I guess I would throw out that um, in the entrepreneurial, the first question you posed, the um, it strikes me sensors and really you know the game that Tom comes from. Uh, other ways measuring other components in the body, if we could measure insulin, we could more safely deliver enough insulin to manage the sugars without overdosing. Um, lactate would give us a good uh, measure of metabolism and exercise balance. Um, better ways of doing the glucose measurement, perhaps less invasively, optical methods. I mean, there's a whole host of researchers out there looking at uh, array of different technologies for doing glucose. Um, so I think for entrepreneurs, there's a huge amount of uh, opportunity here on the uh, sensor side in particular. Okay. Thank you very much to our panelists for participating. Thank you for attending. And we hope to see you at our next event on February 18th. And I believe both of our panelists can stick around briefly to chat one-on-one -on -one, uh, if you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you.